Uh, so this is goodbye YAML, infrastructure as code and closure. Um, before we start, though, I'd like to quickly thank Kim Foster and Alex Miller for doing all the work of organizing this conference. I've been to a number of conferences, and I've never um, been to a closure conj before. This is my first conj, and I have to say I really like the tone. It's a very thoughtful audience, very thoughtful conference. So uh, thanks a lot to uh, Kim and Alex for making it possible, and of course, all the people at Cognitect uh, for sharing this great language with us. Uh, it's brought me a lot of joy in my life. So um, my name's Eno. Uh, joining me on stage is a little bit is going to be Tyler. There's our email addresses if you want to uh, ping us later for questions. This talk is uh, basically in two parts. It's a story of a library and it's a demo. I'm going to be telling the story of where this library came from and Tyler's going to give you a feel for what it's like to use the library. So the story starts uh, at Steady. Um, it's an early stage startup located in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we've just raised our Series A of about $14 million in funding. And at Steady, we're building a global network for B2B structured communications. And that's kind of a dense sentence with a lot of meaning and a lot of words packed into uh, very few letters. So if you go look at our website, uh, it says this, the structured messaging platform for B2B trade. Uh, and it helps, I think, to kind of unpack this because that will help uh, to understand where this library came from and also, you know, just what this company is doing in general. So uh, if any of you have ever worked in purchasing or fulfillment or you have a friend or you know somebody who's doing that work, uh, then you probably know that a lot of the business processes that people are using to do purchase orders, uh, invoices, ship notices, you know, all kind of things that businesses, any kind of structured communication that one business is sending to another, the systems that are facilitating that communication are incredibly archaic, often painful, tedious. Um, and you know, what we're talking about here is it's a trillion dollar market. Any kind of like physical item in the world is touched by these archaic processes. Um, you know, the clothes you put on this morning, the breakfast you ate, the laptop you put in your bag, everything uh, is touched by these, these business processes. Um, and even in the most extreme cases, what we're talking about is people bringing home, you know, giant stacks of paperwork with a ruler and a red pen and literally going line by line by line to make sure an invoice is properly fulfilled or a purchase order is, is fulfilled or whatever. So at Steady, uh, you know, we're trying to make this, a, uh, we're trying to fix this, trying to make it better. Um, so in effect, what we're building is, um, you know, a digital mailbox for any kind of structured communication between businesses. Uh, we're doing it 100% enclosure, and we're using AWS serverless to do it. Uh, so like I said, Steady is located in Boulder, Colorado, which in my opinion is one of the best places to be writing software on Earth. We have a 12-person team, and we're growing. So uh, if you'd like to hear more about that, uh, Tyler and I will hang out afterwards. We're happy to talk with you. So this is basically the bread and butter of what we do. We're using Clojure to solve real business problems, and we're deploying it on AWS. Uh, and this is basically what we do every day. Now, just as Rich chose Java for closure, we like to think that we chose AWS for infrastructure. So, you know, the whole question of multi-cloud um, and all the related problems that go with that, I'm just going to put that aside today, and I'm going to be focusing squarely on AWS. We've adopted AWS, and, you know, our whole world is AWS, so uh, that's going to uh, be the focus of this talk. Nonetheless, you know, some of the things I say I think will be uh, relevant for, you know, the experiences of deploying on other clouds. So like I said, we like to uh, use Clojure to solve real business problems and then deploy it on AWS. Uh, and in particular what that means, or, you know, not just AWS in general, but we're using AWS Lambda, which is um, AWS's uh, serverless offering. And it has all sorts of interesting characteristics that kind of change the way uh, you think about problems. You know, instead of having these long-running JVM processes, we have these short-lived processes and, and cold starts and all sort of new things uh, that make a lot of new things possible as well. Now, um, one of the things that we're, we're using to do all this infrastructure is this tool called AWS CloudFormation. Uh, if you're not familiar with AWS tools, you might have heard of Terraform. It's, in effect, AWS's uh, version of Terraform built in-house. Uh, AWS describes it as a common language to de describe and provision infrastructure. Uh, and that language is written either in YAML or JSON. So for this talk, I'm going to be talking about YAML in particular, but every time I say YAML, you could very well think I said JSON, and the same will apply. 
now the nice thing about this tool is, at any moment, a developer can open a text file and look at what the production infrastructure is. Uh, we've been very rigorous at Steady that we want to have all of our infrastructure codified in CloudFormation. Uh, and that personally helps me sleep well at night because I know there's not any kind of state lurking out there. It's all described in these nice files that we can change and uh, you know, make, new change, uh, make new infrastructure, tear down old, and it's all uh, codified in a single place. So it's a great tool. Uh, and so we've been using it. We've been writing some closure. We deployed on Lambda, you know, and things are good. Then we did that some more. And then we did that a lot. Uh, you can see closure script is sprinkled in here and there where we're particularly concerned about cold starts. Uh, and along the way, we've learned a lot about what it means to take closure and deploy it on Lambda. Um, so this is, this is kind of the world we lived in initially. It was great. We wrote some closure, had a great time, put it on Lambda, solving real business problems. Um, you know, and we wrote some YAML too to do that. And some time went on and then we wrote some more YAML. Wrote some closure, deployed it. We wrote some more YAML. Some closure, deployed it. Then we had a lot of YAML. You know, it's nicely organized, but it was a lot of YAML. Um, then we kind of had a big pile of YAML. And then it felt like we had this huge thicket of YAML. Um, you know, there's a closure in there somewhere, but it felt like to get to the closure, we had to fight our way through a lot of YAML. Um, and that's not a great experience for some reasons that I'll talk about. So when we realized that we had this huge mess of YAML describing all our infrastructure, and when we realized that we just weren't, you know, we weren't totally happy with that experience, we stopped and looked at our tools. So the first thing we looked at was Clojure. And we thought, well, Clojure's great. We actually really like Clojure. We feel like we're productive. We enjoy using it. Uh, we looked at Clojure Script. Same kind of thing. Uh, we like it, we're productive, we enjoy using it. Uh, in fact, if you go look at the Clojure webpage, you'll see this quote from uh, uh, Rich, where he says, I hope you find Clojure's combination of facilities elegant, powerful, practical, and fun to use. And in our experience, Clojure and Clojure Script have been exactly that. Elegant, powerful, practical, and most importantly, well, you know, for the selfish developer in me, fun to use. It's fun to write Clojure all day. And then we looked at YAML, which is the other um, thing that we were using. And in a lot of ways, YAML was just the complete opposite. The experience was completely different. The feeling of using it was completely different, such that you could even graph it like this. You know, you have all the, all the fun stuff in the upper right, fun to use, productive, and then you have YAML in the lower left, which is, you know, I, I don't personally enjoy using it. And we found that when we wanted to make a small change um, or maybe add some new infrastructure, it would be a day, several days, a week, and you know, there's just this feeling inside of not being super happy when you're doing that. And a big part of that is um, you know, syntax errors. It's a white space dependent language, which I'm generally terrible at. But more importantly, you know, you'd, we'd make a mistake. We'd push it out. We'd wait five or 10 minutes for CloudFormation to deploy the infrastructure and say, hey, you got a mistake. You forgot uh, this one required property. Or you got one space, and I need two here. Um, and that's a really terrible feedback loop. Um, and that just kind of compounds, you know, as you're trying to work through a problem, uh, this, this slow feedback loop just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, which is why YAML is not as fun to use as Clojure and Clojure Script. So if you think about this for a moment, it's because YAML has in effect become the assembly language of cloud infrastructure. Um, if you're putting anything on the cloud today, I'm fairly confident to say that you're probably using YAML in some capacity. Um, or to change uh, the wording, to put it in JVM nomenclature, you could say that YAML has become the bytecode of cloud infrastructure. Now, if a person came to you and said, I'm gonna write all my application code in bytecode, you'd probably say, hmm, I'm not sure that's the best idea. Uh, and you know, the reason for that is that we're working with two layers of, uh, two layers of abstraction here. You know, YAML is kind of a lower level concern, and Clojure is a much higher level concern. And you know, all the properties of those two layers uh, are are, are with that. So for example, uh, when you're working in YAML, you're almost certainly having to be much more verbose and you know, have to write a lot more lines to get stuff done. Whereas if you're working in Clojure, you're able to get wonderful things done in a very concise way, which I think is a large part of why Clojure is such a joyful language to use. So this is the world that I think a lot of developers are, are living in. We at Steady were certainly living in it for a while in that we wanted to be solving business problems and deploying it on Lambda, and yet you know, we had this thicket of YAML in front of us that you know, it's kind of hard to see what it is that we're excited about anymore. 
This is the world that we want to live in, I think. We want to be focusing on solving our business problems with Clojure and then getting it out to our customers. So there's also a bigger problem here, though. I mean, there's the, there, there's the problem of the levels of abstraction. And, and you, know, you know, some people don't love YAML. Um, but there's actually a bigger problem here. And that is, how are we going to make infrastructure reusable and shareable across teams, across deployments, across companies even, while maintaining the elegant and powerful facilities of closure. So in the process of building all these uh, systems using closure and deploying it on Lambda, we, we've learned some things. In fact, along the way, we realized that there were some patterns emerging in our application infrastructure. So let me walk you through what I mean by that and give you an example. So one of the patterns that we've used in our infrastructure that we found is very useful is having a, a Lambda that consumes events and takes some kind of action based on that event. So we have some closure. We have a Lambda. We have an SQS queue that the Lambda is consuming events from. We have some source of events, CloudWatch events, for instance, that are originating elsewhere in our system. It's not important where. It's just that's what's filling up the queue. And as responsible engineers, we've also deployed some uh, alarms and monitoring such that if, for instance, a, a message gets stuck in the queue, uh, there's an alarm that will go off that will send a notification to an SNS topic, and then we'll go to an alerting system to get developers involved. Uh, and of course, you know, for anybody who's worked on AWS, you know that you have to have all these IAM policies to get the permissions just right. Um, and as you can imagine, it takes a little while to get all this right. There's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, it's not just a matter of like, you know, putting together 15 lines of code and you're done. You know, you have to kind of like iterate to get all the pieces, the configuration right. Um, and once you've done that, you want to reuse it. You don't want to have to do it again. You don't want to be copy pasting YAML. Um, you want to have this robust way of, you know, I've done the work, I've built the infrastructure, and now I want to reuse this event consumer thing across the board without writing more YAML. That's, that's the really important part. So the first question we asked ourselves was, how does CloudFormation support reuse? You know, the CloudFormation is a powerful tool. The people build it who, are, who built it are very thoughtful. So surely they've run into this problem. And yes, they have. In fact, there are a number of tools that CloudFormation makes possible or makes reuse possible. Um, nested stacks, more YAML. Template snippets, more YAML. Custom resources. I'm guessing you can see the pattern here, more YAML. Uh, and, and then even serverless application model, uh, which has done a fantastic job at making resource declarations much more concise, but nonetheless means that you're still living in this YAML world with all the problems that come with YAML. So at Steady, given the choice between YAML and Clojure, we like Clojure. We want to write Clojure all day. So we had to broaden our question. You know, maybe CloudFormation wasn't the right tool for us, is what we thought. And we said, well, what are the alternatives in the AWS ecosystem? You know, maybe there's a better tool out there that we could be using that will um, help us solve the problems we want to do in a way that we want to do it. Well, it turns out, uh, about a year ago, um, AWS released something called the Cloud Developer Kit, or CDK, or AWS CDK, as uh, it's sometimes called. Um, it's written in TypeScript. Uh, and it's this fantastic tool that allows you to be provisioning infrastructure without all the YAML. So if you go look at Amazon's AWS CDK webpage, they give you this example. Um, to deploy a container onto a Fargate service, which is onto Fargate, which is uh, Amazon's container service, uh, just a container, like a hello world example. We're talking about this much YAML plus 400 lines that I'm not even going to show you, or this much TypeScript. Uh, that's a huge difference. We're talking about 500 lines versus 20 lines to do exactly the same thing. Now, the way the CDK team has done this is that they've gone and looked at all the AWS service offerings, and they've created what they call the AWS construct library, which amounts to a lot of sane defaults, uh, rich primitives that solve the problems that you know, most of us are working with in one way or another without having to worry about all the fiddly bits that CloudFormation makes possible to configure. And the construct library is basically an assemblage of infrastructure constructs. So this thing that I showed you earlier is also an infrastructure construct. And what's really powerful about that is you spend the time to build the infrastructure uh, that is meaningful to your business or the problem that you're solving. You do that once. 
And then you can reuse it over and over and over and over and over because it is exactly this infrastructure construct. So not only are you getting these construct, this construct library that the CDK team has built, you're also able to define your own infrastructure constructs as makes sense. So earlier I said the library was written in TypeScript. Some of you might be thinking he's about to recommend that I should take all my YAML and rewrite it in TypeScript. And honestly, you could do that, but you know, I feel TypeScript is definitely an improvement, but I want to be writing Clojure all day. Well, it turns out, in addition to AWS CDK, there's this very interesting library that ships with it called JSII that allows uh, the CDK team to choose their language of choice, you know, they're working in TypeScript, but to be releasing bindings in Python, C Sharp, and Java. Now, as soon as I said Java, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, why not Clojure? And that's what we thought too. So that's what we did. Uh, we open sourced a library called CDK CLJ uh, about two months ago. Um, it's been a fantastic experience, and I could continue talking it, about it, but I think at this point, uh, well, first of all, I should tell you it's 100% closure, which is great. Um, but at this point, I think it's really better just to show you what it looks like to interact with it and how to use it and so on. So uh, joining me on stage right now is Tyler. He's going to walk you through a demo. All right, thanks, Eno. Live infrastructure demo in the REPL. What could go wrong? All right. So my job is to give you all a sense for what REPL-driven infrastructure looks like um, and can be. Um, and to do that, we're going to go through the process of deploying a, uh, a Lambda um, that's going to run some closure code. It's going to be connected to a S3 bucket. So uh, we designed this from the ground up to be a like first class REPL experience. We wanted to make it as easy as possible to get documentation, make it integrate with doc strings, uh, you know, make it so that you can get fast feedback when there's uh, problems with your infrastructure so that you don't have to go through that long feedback cycle of making a bunch of YAML changes, sending it off to CloudFormation, and then just hoping. All right, so the first command I want to show you is the CDK browse command, which is how you navigate to the documentation. Um, so calling it without any arguments is going to take uh, you directly to the opening page for the AWS CDK documentation. So this is primarily an interop library, um, so this is something very useful to have at hand. Um, so uh, this is going to have the developer guide, which gives you a bunch of background information that's super useful when working with CDK. Um, and it's going to give you the API reference, which is going to give you uh, basically the, uh, uh, a holistic view of all of the packages and constructs that are available to you. So constructs compose lower level cloud formation resources. Um, so there's always an escape hatch to uh, using the lower level resources, but these are gonna give you uh, documentation for uh, both those uh, high level constructs and lower level cloud formation resources. Okay, so let's start to build our infrastructure. Um, and all infrastructure in CDK uh, is a tree of constructs with a app construct at the root. Um, so the other command, or the other function, is uh, the import uh, function. So this maps, uh, since this is an interop library, uh, to uh, the JavaScript import uh, command. So uh, running this, basically, we're pulling out the app class from the AWS CDK core uh, construct library. Um, and when we do this, uh, we get, it does, it does a couple of things. Um, one is it makes the class resolvable in the local namespace. And then the other thing that it does is it makes the symbol uh, an alias for the namespace that gets created behind the scenes for apps. So app is going to have a set of functions around it, things that you can do uh, with apps, um, and those are going to be in a namespace that gets created as a part of this import command. So if I evaluate app, you can see now that this is a uh, resolving to a JSII class. So JSII is that low-level uh, interop library that's enabling us uh, to do this. Um, and in essence, this becomes our uh, constructor to create an app instance, and this is going to form the root of our infrastructure tree. So I'm going to go ahead and evaluate that um, and give it an out there. Um, and at the lowest level, this is generating cloud formation. So this is just saying where, where to put the cloud formation at the end of the day. Um, so it's going to go in the cdk.out directory. And because we've done this uh, in Clojure and uh, uh, reified all of these, or interned all of these as um, uh, vars and namespaces, we get things like doc strings. So we get the documentation for this construct in your REPL um, so that you can uh, use it to uh, make sure that you're doing the right thing. 
Um, so I, I mentioned that that import command does two things. So one is it gives us this class. The next thing that it does is it turns uh, or it uh, converts the app symbol uh, into an alias for the namespace for app. So we can see that uh, the app namespace is going to have a few functions in there, and these are a couple of examples of that. So we can grab doc strings for these functions as well. Um, so you have, since it's an interop library, you have both a static uh, and instance methods. So this is an example of a static method. You can tell that because it doesn't take a this as an argument. Um, and this is an example of a uh, instance method, which is going to take a this as the first argument. It's sort of similar to uh, the Java interop uh, enclosure. Um, so uh, another useful way you can use this browse command is to jump to the documentation uh, directly from a class. So I can pass in that class to that browse command and I can jump straight into the documentation if you need to figure out how to use these things. Um, so a app without any stacks or other constructs attached to it isn't particularly useful. Um, so let's attach a stack to the app. And we're gonna import that from the CDK core uh, package again. And um, the way that we connect this to app is we call uh, the constructor with app as the first argument. So basically, child components attach to their parents. So we can call this constructor, uh, and we get a instance of a stack. And so now we've connected these two things, these two pieces of infrastructure together. So on these resources that we've wrapped, uh, we actually implemented the iLookup protocol on it. So you can use keyword lookup with these things, which is gonna come in handy later when we wanna link all our resources together. So a stack is the minimum deployable unit of CloudFormation, but by itself isn't particularly interesting. Uh, so let's add a bucket to it. And uh, while we're adding a bucket, I wanna show you that uh, some of the examples of uh, the feedback you get. Um, we have put specs on all of these things. So if you try and call one of these things with incorrect information, you're going to get a, uh, a hard failure um, right away with like a spec assertion telling you exactly what you did wrong. So in this case, it takes a ID as a second argument and it's requiring that to be a string. So you don't have to send this off to CloudFormation, wait 10 minutes to find out that. You can find it out right away. Uh, so let's do this correctly now, uh, and give it an actual ID and bind it to our bucket. So at this point, we have a bucket attached to a stack, attached to an app. But that's still not that interesting. Uh, so let's add a lambda, um, because they're all the rage these days. Um, so we're gonna have to import a few uh, constructs to do that. Um, so we're gonna import duration from the CDK, norms, uh, CDK core namespace, code, function, and runtime from the AWS Lambda uh, package namespace. Um, and then we have a little bit of boilerplate here because we need to make a jar for this in order to deploy it. Um, so let me just evaluate these. And while that's building, I'll jump over to the application code that we're going to deploy. Oops. Um, so it's a really basic function. Um, we're going to make, uh, it, it's going to be a web handler. Um, that's why we're uh, returning a status code here at the bottom with a body. Uh, we're gonna put an object on S3 and then read it immediately back. It's not particularly useful or interesting, but I wanna show how we set up things like permissions and all of that. Um, and we're also going to pass in a secret uh, because I saw uh, uh, Gene Kim's talk this morning and one of the bullet points was that doing secrets right is hard. So I wanna show how that works in uh, CDK CLJ. So uh, let's connect our function together here. So I'm gonna import one more library, uh, or one more uh, construct, which is secret value, which is how we're gonna bind the secret. And we're gonna set up our function here. So the way we do that is first we have to tell it where the code is. So above and beyond CloudFormation, CDK is gonna take care of things like asset management. So we have to tell it where our code is so it knows what to upload to S3 so that it's resolvable. Uh, next, we tell it the handler we want to use. So uh, because we're using the uh, de uh, Lambda library, they have this def lambda function that when we compile is going to generate a class named like this that implements the Lambda uh, protocols, or interfaces rather. Um, we have to pass in the handler name and that just has to map directly to uh, the handler name over here, or the class that will get generated. Um, next, uh, we have to tell it the runtime. 
Um, so uh, there's this runtime uh, class uh, that has all of the different runtimes as static properties on it from the interop. So we just want to use the Java 8 runtime. Um, so uh, I'll just show a quick example of how you get feedback with this here. Um, so like this is not a valid runtime. Uh, and uh, you're going to get a hard failure if you try and do that, and it's going to tell you, you know, this is the set of things you can do. So you can use this to deploy Python, Node. Um, in this case, we want Java. <clears throat> so uh, next, I want to show you how we link resources. So we were writing to and then reading from a bucket in that code. Uh, so we need to pass in the bucket name, or it's ideal to pass in the bucket name because it's going to be dynamically generated. We didn't name it explicitly ourselves. So we pass that in as a reference here. And we can do that just using the uh, keyword lookup. And uh, in addition to that, we're going to pass in a secret. Um, so this is a secret that I uploaded ahead of time. And uh, this is just a reference to that that's going to be passed into that Lambda and made available as an environment variable. Uh, the last couple of things are just setting a timeout and memory size so that we don't run into a cold start issue or minimize the impact of a cold start issue. So let's evaluate that to connect it to our construct tree. Um, next, we have to give that permission. So right now, we don't have permission to do anything with that bucket, or that function doesn't have anything uh, permission to do anything with that bucket. And I think this is one of the places that CDK really shines. I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen or done myself set star star permissions on like a CloudFormation resource saying, I'll come back to that later after I fix this, and then never do. Um, this. There's no excuse now. If you're using CDK CLJ, you know, we should be granting uh, fine-grained permissions um, to grant least privilege, privilege um, to follow best practice. So we do this with just the grant function here. And if you actually take a look at the uh, uh, bucket namespace, you know, we get autocomplete for all of the options in there. So this is another reason uh, why it was nice to build this from the ground up. For closure specifically and not to use the Java version, um, having this autocomplete functionality makes everything very discoverable. So lastly, we're going to just make this available via, uh, via REST API through API Gateway. And we do this with the Lambda REST API construct, which is very handy. I don't know if anybody has ever tried to set up API Gateway with CloudFormation uh, by itself. It's not fun. Um, getting the deployments right, invalidating them, pushing it up again, uh, getting all of the methods and resources correct. Uh, is not a fun activity to go through. The last thing that we do is we call app synth, which is going to synthesize this into a CloudFormation template. So I just evaluated the whole buffer there so that we uh, uh, pull in all of these changes. And that's going to dump it into a CDK out directory, um, which is going to take care of our assets. And it's going to take care of uh, uh, building our template. So you can see a JSON version of the CloudFormation template it generates here. So I'm going to jump over the command line now and start the riskiest part of this demo, where we're going to try and deploy it. So before I do that, I want to run the synth command, um, because this is going to show us all the YAML we didn't have to write. Um, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'd prefer not to write this, this size a YAML file. Um, I have. I don't want to do it again. Uh, it's not fun. Um, and we get the leverage of having it build all of these resources for us through CDK. So this is going to take care of policies, roles, methods, all of the things that you'd rather not think about if you don't have to, the API gateway deployments, and uh, generate it in a way that if it evaluates in the REPL, it should deploy um, because of that fast e uh, error feedback. So let's give that a go and see if we can actually do it. So this is another nice value add. Um, so CDK, the, the tooling around it, uh, there is a command line uh, a program that they give you. And it's going to take care of your deployments, packaging your infrastructure, and all of that based off of your uh, CDK declarations. Um, one of the nice things it does is it gives you this nice review page for all of the permissions that you set up. So you can make sure that you didn't put star star in there out of frustration. So I'm going to go ahead and say, yes, I did in intend to make those changes. And this is going to deploy. And while it's doing that, I want to jump over to a uh, larger example, um, just to show you some of the patterns and what this looks like at scale. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not a working example yet. It is a deployable example, but the code side doesn't work yet. I got carried away with the infrastructure. I wanted to show off all the different things you could do. So um, 
you can see here examples of um, doing things like cron uh, jobs uh, by using CloudWatch events. You can see examples of using state machines and hooking those up. Um, so we're pulling in a, a lot of resources here to show you examples of how to uh, hook all of these things up. So I'm gonna jump down to the bottom to show you some of the um, patterns that we use. Um, perhaps the most useful is just regular closure functions. It's very nice to wrap up these complicated constructs as simple closure functions. So in this case, we've wrapped up this entire stack, app stack, as a closure function. And this is very handy for things like environments. So right here, we have a stack for dev, and we have a stack for prod. And we can pass in different configurations for dev and prod, and use that data to basically make decisions about what infrastructure we want to turn on or turn off. So in this case, you might want to turn a timer off in a dev environment uh, because uh, you don't want to run that all the time. Um, you want to run it manually when you're testing it. Uh, the other pattern that I want to show here is like wrapping up a, a common construct that you're going to use in multiple places. So Lambada function uh, carries all of the common configuration and it's used a few times in this namespace. And this is something that could be put in a, uh, a depths project and shared across teams or even open sourced. Uh, so if you have common build tasks or if you have common pieces of infrastructure that are general concepts, you know, you can just turn them into a function, put them in a package and share them. Let's jump back to our deployment. And it looks like we've been lucky and everything deployed. So, uh, you know, this took care of uploading our jar, connecting it to our Lambda function. It created all of our resources for us, and we can verify that. And it uh, spits out a nice uh, URL for the API that it created. And we can just curl that. And this is going to be going through API gateway to Lambda, putting something in S3, reading it from S3, and saying, hello, Conj. 2019. <laughs> you could, of course, done that with YAML, but I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, I prefer this way. All right, so um, with that, I'm going to pass this back to uh, Eno to uh, bring us home. Thanks, Tyler. That was great. So once we started using this internally, we started seeing PRs land like this. Massive deletions. Look at that. <laughs> um, these kind of PRs bring joy to my heart because we're doing exactly the same thing in fewer lines of code. We're making our code more understandable, more changeable, uh, and I like that. So if you go look at what the CDK team has to say about the library and its benefits, they'll say, you know, you can define high-level abstractions, you can organize your project into logical modules, namespaces, functions, you know, whatever. Uh, you can share and reuse your infrastructure, which is a huge point. You spend the time to build it right once and then you share it across uh, whatever unit you'd like to. You're getting code completion with your IDE. That's CDK. CDK CLJ adds yet another bunch of great things to it, in my opinion. Uh, you're working with your infrastructure in the REPL, the environment that we know and love, with the fast feedback. Uh, you're getting spec checking at AWS CDK Boundary, so if you forgot a what required parameter, you passed the wrong kind of parameter, whatever, you're gonna get a nice spec error right there when you evaluate it in your REPL, not waiting 10 minutes to find out you screwed something up. And then finally, you're able to think about your infrastructure in the same language that you're thinking about your business problems, which to me is a huge benefit. Uh, like I said, this is up on GitHub, uh, Steady Inc. That's a little bit hard to spell, but Steady Inc. Uh, slash CDK dash CLJ. Uh, the demos that or the examples that Tyler walked through are up there. Um, you know, try it out, pull it down, let us know what you think. If you don't like something, you'd like to change something, we're open to features or pull requests, issues, you know, all that stuff. Or sorry, not pull requests. I'm not ready for pull requests, but definitely issues and feature requests. Um, so I'm or we're, we're, we're steady. My name's Eno. This is Tyler. Thanks a lot, everybody.